What's going on folks, it's Mike here and welcome to our SDL2 series as we continue talking about Collision. Now as I move this Kong character around, you'll notice some things from the last lesson that we have two colliders around him and I can go ahead and click and detect Collision which is displayed on the console. Now what's new about this lesson is I'm going to talk a little bit about how I cleaned up the code a little bit and how I got that bounding box to be tighter around Kong, or at least that first one. And then I'll talk about some improvements to the abstraction that we have for our collision system and some just general things you can think about while building your API. So with that said, let's go ahead and start looking at some of the code and how some of the code has evolved. So here's our code base in our running program. And again, I can click and you'll see that the collider is hitting one of the collision boxes, but not the other. And I'm gonna wait and go ahead and time it so that we get a collision with both, just so you can see in the console, if I click now, that I'm getting collisions with both the hit boxes. So not much has changed there. Now what has changed though, or what I've updated in the abstraction, just some small updates or refactorings from the last lesson, but I've decided to make a eye collider here. So there's going to be some sort of interface in our actual program, meaning we might want different types of colliders. Again, right now we just have a box around Kong, which is fine, but maybe we'll want a circle or some other sort of convex shape that can surround Kong. So I want to start having an interface so that I can then just inherit from that interface. And I've changed our collider 2D specifically to be called box collider 2D, maybe rect Tangle Collider 2D is more appropriate since a box is three-dimensional, but again, that's just sort of a design decision here. So I've gone ahead and cleaned up the code a little bit to just go ahead and write some comments. So feel free to check out the repository as always in the link below where you can see what's going on here. And again, we'll have to make some design decisions if we have different types of colliders for how we want to handle them. Do we want to handle box collision with any general collider or perhaps have just one method overloaded? And that's going to be something that we'll have to think a little bit about in the future here. So otherwise, one of the main things that I've added for this uh, lesson here or in this code is the ability to set a bounding box automatically. So you don't have to just set the absolute position or the dimensions around the uh, actual sprite character. Because recall with our Kong here, we had a lot of transparency. That's all of this space here that we don't need to use. So the idea is we want to be able to just get a really tight bounding box around Kong where the collision would actually be. So how do we do this or what's the algorithm? Maybe I can go ahead and show you a piece of the code here. And again, I've just got something up and working that I'm happy enough uh, that's working. Uh, in fact, I have a little bit of um, output code here, which I'll just get rid of here. Uh, but the idea is we can actually look at the surface that we've loaded here. And in fact, let me just move this to the side so I can uh, talk through it. But again, the surface is this entire image. And that's something that's loaded up in our resource manager, or if you're just working from this from scratch and joining in this lesson, is just loading a little literal bitmap image, right? And we have the width and the height, the pitch of the image, which is how wide it is. That means R, G, and B color channels times the width. So these three channels, that gives us our pitch, how long this image is in terms of bytes of data. And then we have some other information, of course, like the pixels that we want to get through. And the idea, once we have that information from our image, is then to scan through the image and essentially run this sort of algorithm here. And if we want a tight bounding box around Kong here, what we ideally want to do is find the sort of X minimum point. That is the first point at which there is a pixel here. So that would be maybe his arm or his foot here. And so this is the leftmost pixel. And we want to find out what that location is. So I'm just going to go ahead and label that uh, more appropriately so you can see how it matches on the algorithm, but the X minimum coordinate. And then likewise, if I scan to the right, I'll find the X maximum coordinate. And that is what's the greatest position in our coordinate system. Again, just a Cartesian coordinate space where I have an X axis and a Y axis where I find a pixel that is not this pinkish color. And that's exactly what the algorithm is doing, just keeping track of that. And then it'll do the same thing for the Y minimum value and the same thing for the Y 
maximum value. And that way I can position Kong in any particular position. Maybe he would be here and this algorithm will still work. It just happens that he's centered in this image. So it works nicely here. But this gives me the, again, the tight bounding box around Kong and it works. Now, there are a few flaws with this algorithm. For example, if I just had a stray pixel here, for instance, it would wrap this whole bounding box, but hopefully you would maybe detect that in the program, edit it, and then bring in the image here. So this is kind of nice because if I make edits to Kong, again, I can just have this tight bounding box. Or I could perhaps change the color if I wanted to maybe make a bounding box just around his face and enhance the algorithm in that way. Now, there are some optimizations I could make. For instance, once I I don't need to really scan pixels uh, further to the right once I found the X minimum. So you could terminate this loop early and do all these sort of tricks here, or maybe scan multiple rows at once, etc. But this is just the naive implementation that will give you a sort of a tight, almost shrink wrapped uh, bounding box here. And it works well enough for this implementation. So I'm happy enough with it. So that was one of the major changes that I included here, this algorithm. And part of this, uh, what makes this algorithm interesting is also, um, and you can see all of my output here, which I'll clean up in a future lesson, but I want you to see the actual values or you can uncomment these things just to see what they are um, if you'd like uh, without having to jump into the debugger, which is the other way to do it. Um, but one of the other interesting challenges, um, which I'll update is you have to figure out also how to compute this bounding box, or rather you're looking at the actual surface pixels. So this was originally a 1200 by 1200 image. In fact, let me go ahead and uh, display it here. And <laughs> it's, it's quite large, uh, but I've actually scaled when I run this program to be only 300 pixels by 300, right? So this Kong here that I'm moving the mouse around is only 300 pixels by 300. So there is some scaling factor that I had to take into account when I actually found this X minimum and X maximum value. And I'm also sort of scanning and finding these values in terms of the pitch or the actual byte location. So I also had to divide by the color channels here. So you'll see a little bit of that funky stuff in the code, but I hope this idea is clear. And again, you could do some things to make this code uh, a little bit easier to read. I use some functions like std min and max, uh, which are nice um, to use and make your code a little bit more readable as well. And finally, what this program does, or rather this function here for computing the bounding box is it just returns a vector 2D. And a vector 2D is just a data structure that holds an X and a Y position. So that was a new change. Eventually we're gonna need vector 2Ds and maybe some different operations that we'd wanna do with uh, vector 2D, like computing various normals or uh, perpendicular vectors or to check if two are uh, parallel or these kind of things. So we will build up some of these math uh, library functions as we need them. So that was the main idea with this new kind of bounding box function. I hope you found that interesting or just sort of a thing that you can play with, right? So you don't have to automatically or have an artist or game designer figure out what the bounding box is. Just write a little function like this. Okay, so now that we sort of understand that idea, I wanna show you how else I cleaned up the code a little bit. Uh, and I'm just going to go into our main here. Um, and let me go ahead and maneuver there. And uh, let's just get rid of this here. All right. So in our main, I was feeling that our code was a little bit sloppy in the sense of how would a user really want to use this API or how would I, because you know, I'm the one who's going to be sort of showing you and uh, how this is done. And we had written this code for getting the component of an object, the textured rectangle and setting its position and then setting the dimension and then doing that uh, over and over again. And really what we want to do 90% of the time is when we have some sprite, which is a rectangle with some collider is just set the position and set the dimensions. So in our game entity class here, I added two helper functions here, set position and set dimensions. And what that does is it just loops through all the components that we have, which right now is sprite and the colliders and just sets the position and dimension. So let me go ahead and show you that in the code, just so you can see what's going on. I set the texture position, so the first component, and then I loop through all of our colliders and set their positions. 
and I do the same thing for the dimensions and each of the colliders. Now I can still do this individually if I want to adjust this that's not a problem. So let me go ahead and um, open up our main again and just show you that you know I can still call these functions they're still available but if 90% of the time I want to just set everything in the same position in the same dimension, uh, I can just do this. Or I can call one of these functions to get a specific collider and set its position and dimension, its sort of offset after. Um, and I am thinking a little bit about having a sort of offset for the collider rather than always having to set the absolute position and it'll just sort of offset from its parent because that's usually what'll make sense. Okay, so that's the idea. So I've left this in just so you can see that uh, having these two lines of code here saves me all this uh, blue text here uh, that I'm highlighting um, and it's just a little bit easier because again we want to think about our API what makes things easy because we're sort of wrapping around SDL2 and I, that's why I'm showing you these various functions and we're at the point where we've got the basics but we want to think about how can I make things uh, easy to use in SDL by providing good or at least decent enough abstractions for now and then we'll continue to iterate. Now, the last part that I want to show you is just where uh, for our object one, I am still uh, manually here setting, you know, the collider position to make it larger here, uh, just to sort of exaggerate the effect or show that you can have different uh, position sizes. And then for the uh, other collider that's part of object one here, I go ahead and call that nice function uh, that we wrote here. Uh, let me highlight it just so it's uh, super clear. The set bounding box automatically function. And that goes ahead and grabs some image that we've already loaded here. So some surface from our resource manager. And it's going to ignore the transparent pixels. That's the pink here. And then it'll return the dimensions of that X min and max position. So that's this um, position. Uh, let me highlight it right here. That's what it's uh, returning for us, this position here. And so that's going to tell us where we should set the position of our actual collider. And that's what I do in this next step. So that way, once we've figured out what the minimum bounding box is, we just assign it to the top left corner of Kong right here so that we get that nice tight uh, bounding box there. Okay, so let me go ahead and run this one more time just so you can see that the uh, very close bounding box that we have around Kong has been automatically set and the box above it has been manually set and we could use that for you know putting around Kong's feet or hands or the face or whatever to detect collision at various different points. So with that said folks I hope this was an interesting discussion about how the collision or the colliders have been improved. I'm thinking a little bit more about different types of abstractions we might have, different types of transforms to just make things work a little bit easier. But we're pretty much at the point here where we have enough in our system built to maybe build a simple game, for example, something like a Pong or a Breakout. So we'll see what's in store for our next lessons. And I hope this was insightful and you've learned a little bit more about SDL2 program design and sort of thinking about how you want to build your abstractions. So if you're enjoying this, hopefully we'll see you in the next one and take care folks.